welcome to week four of robotics. Oh my goodness, I can't believe we're on week four. Um, so this week, what we're going to do is finish up our documentary. So um, after today, you saw the whole series and hopefully you really enjoyed it because I think that it really helps to give us just an overview of where we are with the field of robotics and to really highlight um, just the differences between the Western culture and the Eastern culture, right? And to see how the views are different, right? When we, when we travel to Japan and we see how they really embrace robots as their friends and they believe that robots can live just like humans can. And then when we come to the United States, we see how people view robots as more as like a machine that can just help us with a task, right? And they don't really see it as anything more than that. Um, so as we close with this documentary, I do have a writing assignment. It's just like the one from last week. You will choose one out of the two questions and you'll type up a response. It'll be in Times New Roman, font size 12, double space, put a heading with your name and the title. And then you can choose one of the two questions. So the first question says, in the documentary, we saw the Kurobo robots. Um, in Japan, so you're going to see those today. And they, they were created to become companions and friends to the elderly and lonely people. And these robots can recognize the face, so they have a face recognition, and they can even learn about the interests and likes of the person, just like a friend would. So they do have the ability to gain intelligence about people. So my question here with this one is, do you think it is possible for a human and a robot to have a close relationship and build a bond like that of humans? So that's the first one. If that interests you, you can choose that one. The second one says, as the documentary came to a close, one thought shared was that robots will gain intelligence and knowledge about the world much faster than humans. Do you see this as having a positive or negative impact on our future world. Please share details about your opinion. So again, when we're thinking about artificial intelligence, if we are giving our intelligence that it maybe took us years to get, and we're giving this to a robot, we're teaching it to a robot, and they can gain it very, very quickly, how do you see that impacting the future of our world? Do you think that's a positive thing or a negative thing? And tell us why. Um, so yeah, choose the one that's more interesting to you. And then it's going to be about 10 to 12 sentences. And please type it in Google Docs and share it with me. Okay, so I'm going to shut my video and I'm going to put on the rest of the documentary. So I hope you guys enjoy, okay? It's about primitive forms of biological life. This reminds me of early organisms that had eyes. So things like snails, trilobites, uh, even wood lice that we get in our gardens. They're very very simple eyes, but they're, they're photoreceptive. They go toward or away from light. And that's the similar sort of thing here, isn't it? It is. Uh, this is like just having one retinal cell. It's like having an eye with only one element. So it can't, it can't do an image or anything like that, but yeah. it can detect intensity of light. And that's all you need to do. Of that's course. That's all the early animals needed to do. And, uh, and this is an example of really the robotics following the path. Start simple, get complicated. It is, and it's responding to the environment. And what yeah. you've got in evolution that's taken hundreds of millions of years, this is, I guess, the first robotic eye, and it's evolved from this to, to where we are now within a few decades. It's, Essentially, yes. It's rapid evolution of robots, yet again. Owen's robotic tortoises are exact replicas of Grey Walter's original design. I want to see for myself how they work. The touch switch and photoelectric light cell, or robotic eye, interact with the circuits controlling the motors, enabling the tortoise to drive and turn. It's got a little retro robot. I'm going to grab this torch and we'll see. Yep, we'll see what it can do. See if it works. Yep, OK. There, we, there go. we go. And what you see is the, uh, the behavior when it hasn't detected any light. So it's, just... so it's scanning around all the time. We don't like to say it's looking for a light. But if it finds a light, something will happen. So if you'd like to switch the torch on, yeah, and then point it horizontally, nope. yeah, at that. Oh, wow. You will see. He's come straight for me. <laughs> and now that it's hit your foot, when the touch switch is activated, it drives forward a bit, 
turns a bit, forward a bit, turns a bit, yeah. and this enables it to escape from almost any situation. As soon as it's free, it will start scanning for light again. This is what gives the impression of intelligence in that you see a sequence of behaviors that in context seems to be effective and intelligent. <laughs> I mean, this is, for its time, this is incredible ingenuity and, and workmanship, isn't it? Grey Walter was one of the first to show that biological principles can be applied to the field of robotics. Although his double-celled organisms were primitive, they were taking the first steps to make sense of their environment. I want to know how far this technology has evolved. How close are robots to making sense of the world around them? And can we trust their decisions? This is quite literally a life and death issue for all of us. Because it's starting to play out on our roads. I'm not the most confident road user at the best of times. But today, I'm having a very different driving experience. This may look like a normal vehicle, but it's actually a driverless car. Now, this is a type of robot that's already within our society. They're driving on our roads, and we're putting our life in their hands, so to speak, on a regular basis. Now, I've come to Germany, and I'm going to let this thing be in control as it drives me along one of Germany's busiest roads, an autobahn. A little bit nervous. So this is my first time driving on the left side of a car. It's my first time driving, for a long time, uh, an automatic. And it's my first time driving in a robot car. It's a day of firsts. Joining me on the ride is safety officer Andreas and head of development Dr. Miklos Kiss. I've got to admit, I'm nervous. It's like giving, it's giving, handing something of a very precious, it's quite a big responsibility to something that I don't quite know how it works. But any second now, I will hand over the controls to Jack, my trusty driverless car. It's that anticipation, I'm not sure what to expect. All right, let's see what happens. Come on, Jack. So I need to press these buttons. Press it. Keep off your hands from the steering wheel and off the feet, feet uh, my, off the oh, pedals. Feet are off, my feet are off. My hands yeah, are that's off. good. <laughs> so Jack is acting. I love how calm you both are, and my uh, every instinct in my body has just kicked in, and I, I can actually feel my adrenaline. I've gone quite hot and quite sweaty, actually. I feel like I'm going to veer off, and I, I, I know I won't. Um, what I really want to do is, so I can turn around and talk to you now. Yeah, you can. And, and that's safe to do, obviously. Because that's safe to do. I'm trying very hard not to think about the fact that right now, my life is in the hands of a robot. <laughs> there's a police car. I feel bad there's a police car in front of me and I haven't got my hands on the <laughs> Sorry, officer. No one's controlling this car right now. My feet are not controlling any special pedals. My hands are here. My, my, my eyes are closed. I'm on an autobahn in the middle of Germany. It seems so wrong. But I feel so safe. I'm almost like a... Oh, we're, we're, indi <laughs> we're indicated. Thanks, Jack. I wasn't concentrating. The car's central computer makes sense of the world around it using numerous integrated sensors. Oh, right up to Jack. <laughs> Those at the front and rear of the car look left and right, giving a 360-degree view and a range of 250 meters, while a 3D camera scans traffic conditions and road markings. So Jack is constantly sensing every vehicle around us right now, I guess in the same way that I'm taking each of my sensors and getting a holistic view. And I guess that's what Jack is doing as well, isn't it? Well, it's always yes. The car's computer continuously interprets the data from its sensors to generate a 3D map of the world, which it can then safely navigate through. It makes split-second decisions to control the braking, steering, and acceleration. 
that's a huge amount of computational sort of power there. What's that comparable to in terms of other vehicles, maybe? It's comparable to a, a military jets. So right now we're driving something that's comparable to a jet fighter. That's it. I'm getting over the initial shock of actually letting the car take control, but I'm still nervous about its judgment. I can't quite believe its reactions can be as good as mine. So worst case scenario, and a really, really worst case scenario, somebody turned a car over in front of us now. It's what, it's 100 meters ahead of us. Jack would be able to respond quicker than I could. Yeah, quicker than you could. So um, maybe we would be caught in that kind of accident, mm -hmm. but at least we would do better than the human does. Yeah. I would like this car to have superhuman power. So to solve situations I couldn't do on my own. We just had a motorbike go past, we've got vehicles all around us, and it's responding easily as well as I could, if, if, as you say, if not better. We slowed down. That was we slow down. We will, uh... <laughs> I'm really enjoying cruising along this motorway, but I've still got some niggling doubts. Like, if we did have an accident, who would be responsible? This throws up complex ethical and legal questions. If we had a crash right now, whose responsibility is it? Is it my fault? Is it the car's fault? Who... I find it very hard to understand that I wouldn't be responsible if this car crashed. If the system is engaged and accepted it, so the handover is done, then the car is responsible. So the car means, obviously, if the system does something wrong, we at Audi are responsible for what happens. There are clearly legal issues to resolve, but what's really surprised me is that the more I'm being driven around by Jack, the more I trust him. I'm trusting the car to do its job. You are trusting the car to work, to all to take the responsibility. Something we're putting a lot of trust into, into a robot. Yeah, it's, it's a big step forward, I think, in, in our social relationship with robots. Bizarrely, I do feel comfortable letting a robot take control. In a couple of years, we won't think about the robot. It will be natural in daily life. I think that's the nice part of this. So, uh, my grandmother's in her 90s, and she can still remember the first time she saw her very first car. And here we are, what, two generations later, with me with my hands in the air on an autobahn letting the car drive for me. But as much as I have been seduced by the sophistication of the car, when we're off the autobahn, it also reveals how little Jack and other driverless cars truly understand about the world around them. Please take over driving. So why am I taking over now? What's happening? Because we're in a construction area and we don't know uh, how the lane markings will be and how the side barriers will be. Uh, so we don't drive construction areas right now. Okay. Despite all its sensors and computer power, without the lane markings of the Autobahn, Jack can't form an accurate enough 3D map of the world to navigate safely. Even I, as a slightly nervous driver, still have the ability to understand the world so much better than any current driverless car. I can not only identify objects, I know what things really are and do. And that allows me to make profound connections and decisions to cope with much more unpredictable scenarios. Despite the robot car's limitations, I was still amazed to see how far and how fast robots have evolved their ability to make sense of the world and I wonder if one day it will be possible for robots to understand it in the same way we do. Can they grasp the true meaning of things and develop a sense of self to become individuals? Yeah, I'm gonna wave at me now, aren't you? Could they even become conscious? For humans, the key to our understanding of the world is our ability to learn. To discover what happens when you try to get a robot to learn for itself, I've come to a lab in Japan. What have we got going on in here? 
So this is one of our most exciting projects. Uh, it's a robot that can learn. Awesome. Uh, can you tell me about the autofocus of this camera? Things have changed a lot since point and shoot forever is what sort of... This 80s looking throwback is called Robo-V. Okay. For this experiment, Professor Dylan Glass has set Robo-V a challenge. Can it learn to be a camera shop salesperson? Uh, can you tell me about the autofocus of this camera? The software has been redesigned so that it's a lot more responsive. So right now we've got this little robot with one of your colleagues. Yeah, so the, the robot's playing the role of the shopkeeper and it's presenting information about the different cameras. And now the thing that we've been exploring lately with this is that the robot can actually be proactive. So it's not like, you know, Siri or something. It's not answering questions. It's, it's proactively offering things or suggesting things as well. Have you used the clamming before? No, I haven't. The software has been redesigned so that it's a lot more responsive. Oh, wow. That's very cool. Some people think it's a bit heavy, but that is what you get when you buy a top-end camera. To interact with customers and explain camera functions, RoboV is reacting independently. Yeah, this does weigh quite heavy. I understand. What we're exploring here is the concept of how can we program a social robot. Instead of classical programming of robots where you, you program explicitly what the robot should do, uh, this robot has learned everything purely from hundreds of interactions that it observed of other people. So this is called learning by imitation. What's the price? The money is $2,000. The lenses cost extra money. Oh, wow. Thank you for your help today. Thanks for that. To create RoboV's personality, the camera shop scenario was role-played by human shopkeepers and customers. Hi, this one's $2,000. This camera has uh, 18 preset mode. Hi, this one is $550. $550, okay, cool, thank you. No problem. For RoboV to create this database of hundreds of shopkeeper customer interactions, a network of sensors tracked where people moved and microphones captured what they said. Uh, this one's $68. $68, okay, that's really cheap, thanks. Yeah, no problem. What the robot learns from this, um, it learns, again, this is unsupervised learning, it learns on its own to imitate the behavior uh, that it's shown. The locations where people stop in the room, the trajectories that people use when they walk to different places, uh, and it learns all of these things, as well as clusters of, of speech. So. Mm -hmm. Maybe you say the same thing in a couple different ways. You might say, how much is this? How much is this camera? How much does this cost? And it'll notice that those are very similar. So it'll cluster them together. It's got a five times optical zoom. So and from this data, we had the robot automatically learn the logic of how to be the shopkeeper. So you've not programmed the robot to be a shopkeeper and you've not told it what to say or how to respond. It's learned from effectively observing the experiences. Exactly. Can I have a go? Yeah, please do. Can I have some help, please? Sure, what do you want to know about this camera? <laughs> what features does this camera have? Fantastic quality pictures on a good affordable price. I can show you the cheapest camera and we can talk about it. Okay. Can you show me this camera? Of course, his fantastic quality pictures at a good affordable price. You want me to buy that one, don't you? So you are actually a photojournalist and you're used to working with these cameras yourself. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> I'll come look at that one then. Basically, the standard shutter speech goes up to 30 seconds, but then in bulb mode, you can keep the shutter open for as long as you choose. I love this little robot. He's brilliant. What's most surprising about my chat with RoboV is that this almost feels like an actual conversation I would have with a real shopkeeper. So this really is a, a little robot that's behaving just as we would in, in a quite a complex social situation, in a real world situation. So this is, I think, a very powerful concept because it can scale up. If we can capture data of how people interact in the real world on a large scale, we can use that big data to train robots to do very natural interactions. 
Well, instantly the applications there are massive. Not only well, as shopkeepers, but right across the board, you've got medical professions or healthcare and everything. Now, the real challenge is this balance between how controllable is the robot and how much does it learn on its own. So sometimes the robot does things we're, we're not sure why it does it. Uh, excuse me. But overall, it tends to do pretty good behavior. It's fascinating. The other really interesting thing about this is that the robot doesn't know the meaning of anything it does. It's purely behavioral. It's purely imitating what it, what it saw the person do before. Right, so it's not picking up on keywords, uh, camera or, or cost or anything like this. It doesn't even know anything about English. It's learning through imitation, through, through experience. Exactly. Wow. What sort of picture do you What's blowing my mind is RoboV's behavior is so human-like but I really believed it had learned to understand what I was saying. But even if it didn't, does that really matter? It could still sell cameras. As we move forward, it becomes a philosophically interesting problem because now we're really reflecting on how do we learn, how do we think, and how do we, you know, ascribe semantic meaning to things and structure, you know, things in the world. And these machine learning techniques have provided a very interesting lens through which to view the way we, we do our own thoughts. So in the future, I think that these learning systems are really a part of us, right? Technology is always a part of who we are and we, you know, a part of our identity. And this is going to allow us to grow in ways we've never been able to grow before. It's an extraordinary idea that in trying to teach robots to learn human cognitive abilities, we may also learn more about how we think ourselves. The key to this may be to teach robots not to simply mimic our behavior, but to develop a conceptual understanding of the world for themselves, so they can generate human-like thought and behavior spontaneously. I've come to Plymouth University's Center for Robotics and Neural Systems to meet a team of scientists that is trying to do just that. Their robot is called iCub. There he is. This is the iCub. The famous little iCub. And I say little, I mean, it's astounding just how much he resembles, or I keep saying he already, a, a small child. At one meter tall and weighing 22 kilos, iCub not only looks like a child, but learns like one too. Angelo Cangelossi, Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Cognition, is his guardian. It's almost like a two-year-old child, and in fact, like a two-year-old child, we are going to teach it the name of objects, one word at a time. That's what children do between one and a half year of age and two years. You say teach, how does it learn? And what's it got in there? Somewhere? The robot has a simulated brain, and as the brain of a child is able to associate, to learn the correspondence between the sound of a word and the picture of an object. iCub is equipped with cameras to see, microphones to hear, and even smart skin to touch. The information it gathers from the stimuli around it is fed into an artificial neural network a computer system inspired by the human brain. iCub is not simply mimicking human behavior. It is trying to discover for itself the relationships between what it can see, what it can hear, and what it can touch, just like a child. I want to see how it learns. Right, okay, I come, let's put the ball there so you can see. Learn ball. I like to learn. This is a ball. Okay, brilliant. Let's try, let's try another one. What have we got here? Okay, I come. Learn cup. I like to learn. This is a cup. Well done. Right. Okay. So we've taught iCub two new objects. How do I know if he's actually learned this or not? Let's ask him to name them. <laughs> right. Okay. So you show, you show an object, you can then ask for the name. What's this? It should be a cup. It is a cup. Well done. Okay. I'm going to really test him. 
and see if he can find the one I'm asking for. Get pretty close enough. Okay, iCub. Find cup. Okay, now I'm looking for a cup. Oh, his eyes are moving, his head's moving. Yes. And he's tracking the cup. He's not interested in the ball. Try to show the ball also. He doesn't care. Mm. He wants... Oh, he, he likes his the eyes, cup. He, he wants the cup. He's not interested in the ball whatsoever. This is because he had learned to do the two objects. And therefore, it's following what we ask it to do. This is incredible. So we've literally just taught this cute little robot. A two-year-old robot, the names of objects, like a two-year-old child. As toddlers interact with the world around them, they learn from one experience to the next, making connections between what they can see and hear to form the basis of context and meaning. These become the building blocks of intelligence and reasoning. There are things which are harder. You can recognize a cup because of its shape and its color. You can recognize a ball, again, because of a different shape compared to a cup. But what about teaching a robot or a child to understand the number one and number two? How would you do this? One, two, three. And like us, the more we learn, the more complex the tasks we can tackle. Oh, he's looking as well. One. <laughs> Two. This is great. What's going on behind the scenes as he's counting now? We have a brain, an artificial brain, that's been trained to learn to associate sounds, mm -hmm. number words in this case, with its finger position. By doing this, the robot is actually able to use its body to learn that there are sequences which are fixed. For example, one comes before two, two before three, and so on. I guess that's why iCub is so special, because you've got that wonderful integration between the cognitive capability up in here, but also that physical embodiment. You've got the two things combined, haven't you? This really shows why a body is important for a robot, the same way a body is important for a child. Children learn by using their motor skills to explore the physical world around them through touch and movement. As their body interacts with the environment, they learn from each new experience. iCub does the same. In tiny little steps, it is trying to form its own unique understanding of the world and what things actually mean. And just to be very clear, this is this little robot learning to experience the world around him, to, to understand more, to have a greater potential of, of yes, cognitive yes. capabilities. Where do you see robotics like iCub in a generation or two generations time? Will, will iCub have grown up and gone to university and, gone and learned about the world around him? I can see this in the longer term. I don't see this happening in the next five to ten years. We talk about this happening in 20, 30 years time and it seems a long while off. We've been evolving for tens of millions of years, and you've, you've got this little entity that's learning about the world around it now, and it's going from a blank slate to this seeing, interactive, responsive little unit. I think that's both the exciting point and the scary point with robotics. But at the same time, we are in control, so we are determining the evolution of these uh, systems. For now. On this journey, we've met some incredible robots. They're preparing for a voyage to Mars, becoming our friends and companions. My feet are off, my hands are off. <laughs> Navigating us through a chaotic world. And some are even able to learn like us. Learn all. For me, this is the most exciting time. I like to learn. This is about. We are living right at the moment when robots start to gradually piece things together, the first tiny scraps of meaning to create their own unique understanding of the world and themselves. He wants the cup. Once they've achieved this, we will be on the brink of a new era. There is no doubt that robots will continue to evolve and become more and more intelligent. 
and that one day it just might be possible for them to develop consciousness. Imagine a robot that could feel the way I feel, that could be moved by strong emotion, that could love the way I love my daughter. Wouldn't that be incredible? When I started this journey, my main concern was that if robots could develop minds of their own, they might become a threat. No. But now I've started to spend more time with robots, I do feel like I can trust them. It's responding easily. And if robots really could one day become conscious, we need to think not just about how they might affect us, but how we could affect them. But perhaps my biggest fear right now, as we progress towards conscious machines, is not what we will need to do for robots, but what we will discover about ourselves. The whole of our society, our law, our education is based around consciousness, making conscious decisions. And if we show that, well, actually, that's quite trivial, and we can reproduce it <laughs> in an afternoon in a lab, then it's going to make people think, well, how important is human life because it is conscious? Ultimately, the rewards uh, will be positive, but you have to be very, very careful. Socially, it might be disruptive. The extraordinarily fast evolution of robots really is going to change our place in the world. And that raises urgent social issues for us all. We need to be responsible to make sure that we stay in control we have the opportunity right now to prepare for conscious robots that think and feel in the same way we do. To prepare for what I think is the inevitable. Investigate the past, present and future of robots and their effects on our lives. Go to the address on screen and follow the links to the open. And that's a wrap. I hope you guys enjoyed that documentary. I know I did. And um, it really got me to thinking, especially as a Christian, somebody who, you know, believes in the creation um, versus evolution. You know, I have to stop myself and be like, hmm, I, you know, what does the Bible say about this? What, how does God feel about all of this? You know, and I believe he does inspire us and give us ideas to create, you know, especially in the field of robotics. But I think at the same time, you know, we have to stop and ask ourselves, you know, yeah, like what place will these have, you know, in our lives? And, and like, just make sure that we really are you know, being faithful to our beliefs, you know, and that we're creating things that will help the world, right? And not that they would bring harm in any way. And so, I don't know, these are things that you guys are going to have to think about more than me, right? Because by the time you're an adult, I'm sure robots will be so much a part of your lives. And you, you're going to probably have to make decisions on things that I never did have to do that, and you know? And, and so it's just these future generations are gonna have to really just stop and think, gosh, you know, what part do I want robots to have in my life, you know? And what's acceptable to me as far as, you know, what's allowed, you know? And because it can go as far as like, I mean, I could think of so many crazy scenarios if we were having a discussion right now, but you know, if they really believe robots can be like people, what's gonna stop them from thinking that, you know, that you can't marry a robot? or that you can't have a robot child or that, you know, a robot pet. Like, I mean, it's just when we think ahead to the extent of what, how people can push it, right, to, to limits that as Christians we may not feel comfortable with, we have to stop and ask ourselves, like, you know, yeah, I, I believe that we should be in, uh, we should be a part of every industry in the world. Be, and we should be leaders in every industry, which is my hope for you guys, right? that you will push yourself to get involved and become a leader in whatever field you go into. Why? Because you carry the light, you carry the truth, and God will inspire you with ideas, especially in these robotics field, in the field of robotics, that will really enhance and be, you know, um, just a help to society, right? And it will be used for good and not for bad, right? 
So that is my hope. And I'll be back with you guys next week, but I'll be looking forward to reading your responses. Let me know if you have any questions with this. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys.